you watched my CPAC 2024 video, you no doubt at least got to the part at the beginning about Project 2025. Uh, or maybe you haven't seen that video. Maybe you've seen on social media Jack Posobiec going around saying at CPAC, which I was in the room for, uh, that they are going to try and basically kill democracy. Which he said as a joke, but also not as a joke, because that's really what Project 2025 is. For those who don't know, broadly, Project 2025 is a collaboration from a group of far-right conservative think tanks to lay the structure of a conservative governing state that will hit the ground running as soon as Trump gets in office. And what that means is at nearly every level, every issue you can contemplate, these conservative think tanks have found ways to upend the democratic process, or at least plan to under Project 2025. And I'm going to go through in this stream the myriad ways which they plan to do that, from LGBTQ rights to abortion rights to rolling back environmental regulations to why all those things are bad, to immigration rights, to tax law, to an emphasis on Christian nationalism. And I want to be clear that the scary thing here isn't just Trump's next term, but what the people behind Project 2025 plan to use Trump to accomplish, which is, in, in their own words, in so many ways, a total theocratic overhaul of the United States that would bring everything into their vision of what a country should be. So I wanted to start with a brief kind of overview, um, and this is on a blog from Thomas Zimmer, who I'm not, I'm not familiar with. And for this stream, I will be sourcing a lot of, I'll, I'll be sourcing plenty of different sources, ranging from news outlets like just NBC, MSNBC, to opinion pieces, to blog posts, places like Rolling Stone and Vice. And I encourage you to not only find those sources, but seek others out for yourself because there are so many little details. The thing about Project 2025 is that it's based on, from the Heritage Foundation and from these other think tanks, when they announced it last year, they put out this thing, this mandate for leadership, which is essentially a write-up of all of their plans for governance. The thing is, it's 900 pages long. So it's, it's not a, a, a breezy afternoon read. <laughs> And there's a, lot of, there's a lot of boring and useless just governmental shit in there. But in between the lines, a lot of people have already gone through the effort to find the important bits, which is kind of what we're, we're going through today. And I wanted to start off by talking about the overriding theme of Project 2025, which is Trump seeking revenge. And this is something, if you've paid attention, if you watched the CPAC videos I did where I attended CPAC, you'll know that that is an overriding theme, not just of Trump, but of his sycophants and lackeys. This idea that the Biden administration has been using uh, lawfare, is their, their new term that they love to use, to pursue cases against people like Trump, just because they don't like him, basically. Not because Trump and the people around him continually and have provably been shown to do crimes, or at the very least, be caught a little bit too close to people who do do them. And part of this revenge would unify, it would be the unitary executive theory, which we will talk about later, but it would basically unify everything under the purview of the executive branch. From Democracy Americana, Project 2025 promises revenge, oppression, and autocratic rule. Kevin Roberts, and this is a name that we will hear pop up again and again throughout this, um, because he has been m one of the biggest figureheads of Project 2025. Other people, Trump, Steve Bannon, plenty of other people in Trump's past and future cabinet, uh, future being, you know, hopefully not, but the ones that they hope will be in the future cabinet, have talked about 2025 
Kevin Roberts really appears to be the mastermind, or at least the figure most spearheading it. Launched in April 2022 under the leadership of the Heritage Foundation, it stands out because it unites much of the conservative movement and the machine of think tanks as well as activists and lobbying groups behind the goal of installing a much more effective, more ruthless right-wing regime. It comes with tremendous funding and backing of much of the political right. As members of its advisory board, Project 2025 currently lists 101 organizations and institutions. It's a who's who of right-wing actors, the Alliance Defending Freedom, America First Legal Foundation, Center for Renewing America, Claremont Institute, Hillsdale College, Liberty University, Young Americans Foundation, Moms for Liberty, and so on. And many of these we've talked about or were at least at CPAC. In April 2023, Heritage published a 920-page report titled Mandate for Leadership. It is the latest in a long line that Heritage has produced in irregular intervals since 1979. This one serves as the policy agenda for Project 2025. Department by department, agency by agency, it outlines what the right wants to do with, to the executive and administrative state, immediately upon returning to power. It provides not only a distillation of what Project 2025 has come up with in terms of plans for concrete action, but also of the ideological forces and influence that shape this agenda. This leads right into Kevin Roberts' more substantial foreword to the whole report, which he has called, quote, a promise to America. Quote, our political class has been discredited by wholesale dishonesty and corruption. Look at America under the ruling and cultural elite today. Inflation is ravaging family budgets. Drug overdose deaths continue to escalate, and children suffer the toxic normalization of transgenderism with drag queens and pornography invading their school libraries. Overseas, a totalitarian communist dictatorship in Beijing is engaged in a strategic, cultural, and economic cold war against America's interests, values, and people, all while globalist elites in Washington awaken only slowly to that growing threat. Moreover, low-income communities are drowning in addiction and government dependence. Contemporary elites have been Contemporary elites have even repurposed the worst ingredients of 70s radical chic to build the totalitarian cult known as the Great Awakening. I've literally never heard anybody on the left call anything the Great Awakening. Like, that, that's an entirely just a manufactured thing that he's making up. And now, as then, the Republican Party seems to have little understanding about what to do. Most alarming of all, the very moral foundations of our society are in peril. But that brings me to the second article I have from Salon. Project 2025 is more than a playbook for Trumpism. It's the Christian Nationalist Manifesto. One of the biggest things driving Project 2025 is the idea of Christian nationalism, which is the idea that the United States should derive everything from Christian Judeo-Christian law and tradition, that we were founded as a Christian nation, and essentially, we need to do away with any idea of the separation of church and state. Christians can kind of justify anything using the Bible. As, as we've seen, talking about our hate church, um, Sure Foundation Baptist, and the NIFB hate churches, when people are hateful and they want to justify that hate, they can tie themselves into all kinds of pretzels to use the Bible to justify it. So the idea of using that same Bible and that same pretext to craft laws in, in what is essentially supposed to be a democracy, essentially supposed to be a free country, and use those laws to affect others is one of the scariest parts here because it's not based in science or logic or reason or tangible fact. It's based on an old book that people have been following for thousands of years. Bryn Lumiere, thank you for super chatting $5. I don't know what the people who won't benefit from Project 2025 think they'll get. It's bad for everyone, not just their enemies. They, here's the thing. The people who were cheering for Project 2025 at CPAC, they see it as revenge. They see it as a victory over the, the woke left. They see it as returning like using their weapons against them and all the the bad guys will finally be in prison and the storm will finally be arriving to, to use QAnon terminology and they'll drain the swamp and everything's going to be just perfect and peachy and hunky-dory for them anyway back to this article from salon.com when jack posobiec took the stage at the conservative political action conference he held up a christian symbol a cross making clear that like many on today's far right his goal is to replace democracy with a christo fascist regime which is what he says he said we are going to replace we are going to destroy democracy we are here to 
No, we're here to overthrow democracy and replace it with this. And he held up uh, a cross on a rosary, I believe. One could argue they've already made this goal the Republican Party's platform. They've been generous enough to spell it out in a Christian nationalist manifesto from the Conservative Heritage Foundation called Project 2025. Mainstream media outlets have begun to expose the radical vision. A gutted federal government, immigrants rounded up in work camps and deported, a military response to peaceful demonstrations, oppression of women, minorities, the poor, and the disadvantaged. For the media, it is simply an extreme conservative plan. When I read Project 2025, I recognized immediately that it is a 1,000-page Christo-fascist screed. How would I know? I'm a product of Christian nationalism. We won't be reading this whole thing, but I do recommend you go read this article because it is a good, fascinating breakdown of um, from a, a former insider's perspective. Just some of, like, here, here we go, uh, talking about uh, Paul Dans closes in an introduction with, as Americans living at the approach of our nation's 250th birthday, we have been given much. As conservatives, we are as much required to steward this presage heritage for our next generation, end quote. And back to the article, I know from my Bible studies, he is channeling, channeling Luke 12, 48. From everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded. Project 2025 is riddled with this type of Christo-fascist language. Christian nationalists do not write or speak without referencing the Bible. And this was another thing you saw at CPAC. It is a language American voters would do well to understand before November, or it will be the language of our government. This one from theweek.com. MAGA faithful draft plans for America's Christian nationalist future. Some of Donald Trump's closest allies are laying the groundwork for a potential theocracy if he wins a second term in office. Although a draft document of Center for Renewing America priorities for a second Trump administration obtained by Politico does include a bullet point for Christian nationalism, the document is, quote, short on specifics, Vanity Fair said. Instead, it focuses on pushing Trump to, quote, ignore undesirable funding allocations approved by Congress and invoke the Insurrection Act on his first day in office, which you may or may not know, probably <laughs> won't be an insurrection and just planning to invoke the Insurrection Act on his first day is not... Not a great look already. Um, it, it, it literally is just a power grab. Like, literally just a power grab. Despite the lack of specifics, Vote and his allies, including former Trumpet admin official William Wolf, have, quote, long used interpretations of Christian doctrine as the basis for hardline stances against abortion, immigration, and same-sex marriage, the Daily Beast said. This past October, Wolf told attendees at a, quote, Jesus and Politics conference that, quote, now is the time to arms again. I think we are getting close. Two months later, Wolf shared then deleted a post on X calling for no for ending no-fault divorces, reducing access to contraceptives, ending surrogacy, ending public school sex education, and several other policies designed to restore the American family. Uh, the idea that ending public school sex education should be part of restoring the American family just really sounds like they just want teenagers to get pregnant. Which they probably do. The Christian nationalist aspect out of the way. And we will see more of that peppered throughout. Um, because really, the thing about Project 2025 is it's all interwoven. Like, every aspect of it interacts with another. And I want to talk about one of the other overriding aspects of it. The unitary executive theory. Uh, this is from The Week. The Heritage Foundation's Project 2025 wants to reshape America under Trump. While the plan has not gained significant amounts of traction in the national news media, Project 2025 is the brainchild of the Conservative Heritage Foundation an effort to rescue the country from the grip of the radical left, quote-unquote, with a, quote, governing agenda and the right people in place ready to carry this agenda out on day one of the next conservative administration. It is a mission to dismantle the federal government and replace it with a vision closer to Trump's own, the Associated Press said, and is essentially a government waiting for the former president's return or any candidate who aligns with their beliefs. The full Project 2025 consists of an outline that mandates four doctrines to implement the to implement in the event of a conservative presidency. The first is to restore the family as the centerpiece of American life and protect our children. The second is to dismantle the administrative state and return self-governance to the American th people. Third would be defend our nation's sovereignty, borders, and bounty against global threats. And the last doctrine of the project is to, quote, secure our God-given individual rights to live freely, what our constitution calls the blessings of liberty. As the project outline shows... This would involve the consolidation and retooling of dozens of federal agencies to place them fully under Trump's auspices. The project is mostly based on a legal principle called the Unitary Executive Theory, which asserts that the President of the United States has complete power to control the executive branch of the government. The theory is an interpretation of Article 2 of the U.S. Constitution, which states that the country's executive power, quote, shall be vested in the President. Proponents of the Unitary Executive Theory 
argue that this vesting of power gives the president complete control of the executive branch. So Congress cannot empower agency heads to make decisions or restrict the president's ability to fire them, the time said. The theory is often a point of debate among scholars, but it has been championed by conservatives. I fucking wonder why. The Reagan administration first developed the theory, quote, as they sought to advance a deregulatory agenda. The plan would also seek to fill the government with Trump loyalists by scouring records and social media accounts to rule out heretics, effectively administering loyalty tests, and launching a so-called presidential administration academy that tutors future MAGA bureaucrats, Politico said. This would ensure that what remains of this slashdown bureaucracy is reliably MAGA conservative, not just for the next president, but for a long time to come, and that the White House maintains control of it. So what you are looking at when they say government in waiting, this is not a plan to just have one term of Trump, one term where they go all out. They are laying the groundwork so that they can fire thousands upon thousands of federal workers and replace them, replace government workers with people who have essentially been indoctrinated to follow everything they want as a nationalist vision. Using these powers as a baseline, Project 2025 presents a, quote, Christian nationalist vision of the United States, one in which married heterosexuality is the only valid form of sexual expression and identity. All pregnancies would be carried to term even if it requires coercion or death, and transgender and gender nonconforming people do not exist, the New Republic says. Roman Omen, thank you very much for super chatting. $4.99, you're now $5 more sexy. Thank you. What can you say about Project 2025 that will comfort those in fear of it? Hope for those worried. Stay strong all. Um, I don't even know. I Like, I... I've been seeing some people on social media talk about Project 2025 in terms of, like, some of this stuff is already happening. Like, nobody nobody cares when Biden does it. Nobody cares when Biden rolls over on trans people and queer people. And to an extent, some of those things are true. The problem is there is a difference between being indirectly harmed by a government that doesn't care about you whether you're a person of color, whether you're a woman, there's a difference between being indirectly harmed by Biden's inaction on something and what Project 2025 wants to do, which is to directly target, specifically, methodically, trans people, queer people, people of color, women seeking abortions. Like, as, as we'll talk about later, there is a plan as part of Tro Project 2025 to ban abortion at a federal level. And while that is going through, because they anticipate states are going to fight it, any woman who travels to another state to get an abortion, there are plans in place to track those women, compile files on them to charge them with crimes, to essentially charge them with murder from trying to go to another state and getting an abortion. Like, that is the level of government overreach they are aspiring to here. This is, this is not conspiracizing I'm, I'm doing here. This is not like Alex Jones. I, th there are so many things that, if they get control, will happen. So, the, unfortunately, the best thing I can say is, is, like, yeah, this is a real vote blue no matter who case. Like, for real. And that's not great. I would love it if we didn't have the shitty Democrats that we do have right now who just seem to really do nothing of value. But this isn't a case that we can come back from. Like, like as we were, were showing earlier, if Trump gets in office, they are laying the ground plan for even if Trump isn't in office for the term after, this style of governance to continue without him when he's gone. So this, this is not a mistake that you can come back from, is, is the thing. So yeah, let's go over, from New York Times, let's go over the executive theory and what that will actually accomplish.
Mr. Trump and his associates have a broader goal to alter the balance of power by increasing the president's authority over every part of the federal government that now operates by either law or tradition with any measure of independence from political interference, according to a review of his campaign policy proposals and interviews with people close to him. Mr. Trump intends to bring independent agencies like the Federal Communications Commission, which makes and enforces rules for television and internet companies, and the Federal Trade Commission, which enforces various antitrust and other consumer protection rules against businesses under direct presidential control. He wants to revive the practice of impounding funds, refusing to spend money Congress has appropriated for programs a president doesn't like, a tactic that lawmakers banned under Nixon. He intends to strip employment protections from tens of thousands of civil career servants, making it easier to replace them if they are deemed obstacles to his agenda. And he plans to scour the intelligence agencies to remove officials he has vilified as, quote, the sick political class that hates our country. Quote, what we're trying to do is identify the pockets of independence and seize them, says Russell T. Vogt, who we just talked about, who ran the Office of Management and Budget in the Trump White House and now runs a policy organization, the Center for Renewing America, or CRA, who we just talked about. The strategy in openly talking about such paradigm-shifting ideas before the election is to plant a flag to shift the debate and later be able to claim a mandate. He said he was delighted to see a few of Mr. Trump's Republican primary rivals defend the norm of Justice Department independence after the former president openly attacked it. Uh, Cookie Sands, does this project benefit literally anybody? Yes, rich people. We we will get to the deregulatory stuff in a minute. Um it, it is entirely created, concocted at every level to solely benefit the rich and the wealthy. From the Michigan Advance, Project 2025, if allowed, will cement America as a right-wing authoritarian state. In 1970, as political activist Angela Davis languished in a jail cell for a crime she didn't commit, acclaimed writer and civil rights activist James Baldwin warned her and us in an open letter, quote, if we know, then we must fight for your life as though it were our own, which it is, and render impassable with our bodies the corridor to the gas chamber, for if they take you in the morning, they will be coming for us that night." End quote. In 2023, women of childbearing age, young adults, children, African Americans, undocumented immigrants, and other marginalized communities have the most to lose if Donald Trump wins a second term because he's coming for us. Funded by the Heritage Foundation, Koch Brothers, and a vast and secretive dark money network, the project has recruited at least 80 far-right organizations and entities. Conservative warriors plan to, quote, defund the Department of Justice, dismantle the FBI, break up the Department of Homeland Security, and eliminate the Departments of Education and Commerce. The president would have, quote, complete power over quasi-independent agencies such as the FCC. And they want to ensure that what remains of this slashdown bureaucracy is reliably MAGA conservative. Meyerson, editor-at-large at the American Prospect, said far-right conservatives and the Heritage Foundation have an extensive enemies list that includes, quote, welfare recipients, lazy and liberal civil servants, anti-business regulators, environmentalists, and union bosses, scientists, woke bureaucrats, woke educators, woke diplomats, woke generals and admirals, G-men, and anyone who doesn't indulge the next Republican president's every whim. In the commentary titled, The Far Right Has a Plan to Remake America, they even wrote it down. Those in charge in the incoming administration are prepared to purge those deemed disloyal after identifying and interviewing, quote, every Treasury Department official who participated in its DEI activities and programs and make such activity, quote, per se grounds for termination and em employment. In interviews, rallies, and on social media, and here we go back to the, the revenge stick. Trump has boasted of unleashing political violence, targeting and crushing his enemies, routing the media, and appointing a special prosecutor to pursue Joe Biden and his family for alleged corruption, and snatching up undocumented immigrants and holding them against their will in vast concentration camps before dis uh, deporting them. In addition, a number of critics <clears throat> in addition, a number of critics charged during Trump's revenge tour, he and his allies are determined to establish a right-wing authoritarian, theocratic white nationalist government. Writing recently on Truth Social, Trump said, quote, Republicans are already thinking about what we are going to do to Biden and the communists when it's our turn. And again, I cannot stress enough, there's nobody in the United States government that is a fucking communist. We pledge to you that we will root out the communists, Marxists, fascists. Fa I feel like if he rooted out the fascists, he wouldn't have much of a government to go back to. And the radical left thugs that live like vermin within the confines of our country that lie and steal and cheat on elections. They'll do anything, whether legally or illegally, to destroy America and to destroy the American dream. The threat from outside forces is far less sinister, dangerous, and grave than the threat from within. 
Political consultant and media strategist Rick Wilson expressed alarm at the Trump-induced danger that looms. Quote, he's using the power of government, the state, to punish his political enemies, use the power of the state to achieve his personal political vengeance on people he believe has wronged him. This is not America. This is something much darker, much different, much more dangerous. From Alex Aronson, executive director of Court Accountability, quote, Project 2025 is a plan to destroy the U.S. government. It is an enormous problem, a huge problem that the U.S. government isn't standing up to at this moment. It's complicated and speaks to some tensions on the left. We have uh, an interview with, I wanted to go through this New York Times interview really quick with um, Kevin Roberts, uh, the Heritage Foundation, because there's a about halfway down from the New York Times, they question him, saying, One priority for both your organization and the Republican Party writ large is reducing the size of the federal workforce. What do you envision when you say you want to destroy the administrative state? His response this is the guy spearheading the Project 2025 right now. I envision the destruction that I'm referring to, which I presume is the real focus of your question, as a political entity being significantly weakened. People will lose their jobs. Hopefully their lives are able to flourish in spite of that. Buildings will be shut down. Hopefully they can be repurposed for private industry. But the administrative state, most importantly what we're trying to destroy, is the political influence it has over individual American sovereignty. And the only way to do that, or one of the ways to do that, is to diminish the number of unelected bureaucrats who are wielding that power instead of Congress. Their response. So the goal is to try to essentially fire a lot of career civil servants, many of whom have had decades of experience in government. His response, many of whom have decades of experience putting government power above American sovereignty. We're not saying they're bad people. We're not saying we want harm to come to them. He, he literally is. Let me be really clear about that. This is heritage, you know, not some fringe group on the right. Come on. We're talking about destroying political power, and they have political power, and they wield it. I just want to explain what Schedule F is. This is their the New York Times interview response. What Schedule F is, it's an executive order that would reclassify tens of thousands of government workers, taking away their unemployment protections. And some estimates say that hundreds of thousands of several federal workers would be impacted. I think the federal workforce is something around 2 million. His response, yes, ultimately. That estimate in terms of the number affected seems high to me. I've seen 50,000. I ultimately don't know the precise number, but that's a comfortable range. Because what, what he's talking about there is the idea that because we have a lot of regulatory bodies watching industries, watching medical associations, pharmaceutical companies, uh, the FDA, Food and Drug, CDC, Center for Disease Control, because we have these regulatory bodies, it comes back to this idea. You you see saw it a lot during COVID where people, they conflate the ideas of American American freedom and independence with not following rules. And those rules... Well, if it directly, if it infringes upon my rights, but it might help somebody else, I don't need to follow it. The problem is, is that they're basically doing this rollback, as I'll show in a little bit, as an effort to just continue making money for rich assholes. Like, that's, that's really all they're doing here. From The Guardian. Key components of Project 2025 include slashing funding for the Department of Justice, dismantling the FBI and Department of Homeland Security, and killing the Education and Commerce Department's moves that MAGA allies champion to shrink the, quote, administrative state and deep state. One ominous plan has waited would allow Trump to invoke the 1871 Insurrection Act on his first day in office, greenlighting using military forces against political foes and demonstrators protesting a new term for Trump, according to the Washington Post. Project 2025 also envisions schemes for changing federal service rules that will allow Trump to cut tens of thousands of civil service workers and replace them with ones deemed loyal to Trump's agenda. We've talked about this. Other Department of Justice veterans say Trump and his loyalists pose unprecedented dangers. Quote, the plans being developed by members of Trump's cold to turn the DOJ and FBI into instruments of his revenge should send shivers down the spine of anyone who cares about the rule of law, said Michael Bromwich, a former inspector general at the Justice Department. Trump and right-wing media have planted in fertile soil the seed that the current Department of Justice has been politicized, and the myth has flourished. Their attempts to undermine DOJ and the FBI are among the most destructive campaigns they've ever conducted. Bromwich point was underscored when days after special counsel Jack Smith unveiled a four-count criminal indictment of Trump involving his multi-pronged efforts to subvert Biden's 2020 election, Trump posted, quote, if you go after me, I'm coming after you. We talked about what these things affect will affect broadly, but what are these really going to affect moment to moment? And this is e, &E News by Politico. Conservatives gear up for EVA, EPA revamp in 2025. 
EPA would see a return to Trump administration policies that elevated deregulation and downsized the agency, which led to tumult among staff and questions over its future. Quote, this is a serious report and needs to be taken seriously, says Stan Myberg, who served 39 years at the EPA, including as acting deputy administrator during the Obama administration. EPA will be overhauled. What does that mean for climate policy itself? Against a backdrop of record-breaking heat and floods this year, the $22 million endeavor, Project 2025, was convened by the notorious right-wing climate-denying think tank, the Heritage Foundation, which has ties to fossil fuel billionaire Charles Koch. The guide's chapter on the U.S. Department of Energy proposes eliminating three agency offices that are crucial for the energy transition and also calls to slash funding to the agency's grid deployment office in an effort to stymie renewable energy deployment. The plan, which would hugely expand gas infrastructure, I fucking wonder why. Could it have anything to do with the oil billionaires running everything and the rich people who want to make all of this happen? Hmm. Was authored by Bernard McNamee, a former official at the agency. McNamee was also a Trump appointee to the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. He previously led the far-right Texas, Pu Texas Public Policy Foundation, which fights environmental regulation. Shocker. Another chapter focuses on gutting the EPA and moving it away from its focus on climate crisis. It proposes cutting the agency's environmental justice and public engagement functions, while shrinking it as a whole by terminating new hires and low-value programs. Why, why is it so bad that the EPA would be gutted that they wouldn't focus anymore on climate change. From the World Meteorolo Meteorological Organization, climate change indicators reached record levels in 2023. State of Global Climate Report confirms 2023 is hottest year on record by clear margin. Records broken for ocean heat, sea level rise, Antarctic sea ice loss, and glacier retreat. Extreme weather undermines socioeconomic development. Renewable energy transition provides hope. Cost of climate inaction is higher than the cost of climate action. The WMO report confirmed that 2023 was the warmest year on record with the global average near surface temperature at 1.45 Celsius with a margin of uncertainty above the pre-industrial baseline. It was the warmest temperature 10 year period on record. On an average day in 2023, nearly one third of the global ocean was gripped by a marine heat wave, harming vital ecosystems and food systems. Towards the end of 2023, over 90% of the ocean had experienced heat wave conditions at some point during the year. Here's a uh, global temperature difference in the last couple hundred years, by the way. So the shit that's already bad environmentally in terms of the world under 2025, Project 2025, would just get worse. Like, like not... As it continues to get worse now, because get, we're, guess what? The liberals aren't doing nearly enough for, for actual climate change. Shocker. But again, this is the difference between cutting off your leg or letting the entire body die. And it's, it's for, make no mistake, those measures to expand, as we were talking about, uh, gas manufacturing and gas pipelines, it's for rich people to make money. Like that's, that's who wants Project 2025 to pass because of deregulation like this. So we've talked about Christian nationalism so far. We've talked about the efforts to deregulate. We've talked about how Trump wants to weaponize the government to go after his political opponents. Let's talk about these effects of Christian nationalism and what they will have on legislation, particularly as it applies to personal liberty, the thing that they want to talk about a lot. Uh, and first up, I want to talk about abortion because this Rolling Stone article is a phenomenal. If, if I will, I would recommend going and reading it for yourself because I'm not going to go over the whole thing here. But it's a phenomenal breakdown of what their actual plan is with this and why it is so unbelievably heinous. Rolling Stone inside the MAGA plan to attack birth control, surveil women and ban the abortion pill. The document explicitly names their intention not to just to rescind FDA approval for the abortion pill if they regain control of the House, but revive a 150-year-old law that criminalizes sending or receiving through the mail any article, instrument, substance, drug, medicine, or thing that could be used to facilitate an abortion. And this, this along with the Insurrection Act, really paints a picture of how deep down the rabbit hole they're reaching, reaching to find anything they can claw back out so that they can just throw it out there 
and, and make it part of their legal precedent. Even, even though it is so ridiculous to try and apply these things, obviously, but that's okay. Because if, if they get in power, again, they'll be able to do that. As, as we'll see, I, I'm almost ending with the trans stuff because it really lays bare how much they will be able to redefine anything that doesn't already agree with them to make it all agree with them. And that's, that's really the, like, the way that they literally want to change terminology and science around trans people and queer people brings into such stark focus how much they truly want to just take everything over and leave no possible trace for dissent. Those plans and many more, including proposals to attack contraception access, use the CDC to increase abortion surveillance and data collection, rescind a Department of Defense policy to, quote, prohibit abortion travel funding, punish states that require health insurance plans to cover abortion, and retool a law that is currently protecting pregnant women with life-threatening conditions. All of these are outlined in Project 2025's Mandate for Leadership. Severino says suggests that reimport, reimposing the old rules as a stopgap measure while the HHS... Here we go. Okay. Writing for Project 2025, Severino calls abortion pills, quote, the single greatest threat to unborn children now that Roe v. Wade has been overturned. He proposes that as an interim step, the next HHS secretary immediately reimpose old regulations that required the pill to be dispensed in person under a doctor's supervision, a requirement researchers have long argued is unnecessary. His proposal would also shorten the period in which mifeprestone could be prescribed to terminate pregnancies, seven weeks gestations or less compared to 10 weeks today. Severino suggests that reimposing the old rules as a stopgap measure uh, works to revoke Mifeprestone's FDA approval, which he declares in language echoing the anti-abortion activists who brought the lawsuit challenging the drug's approval was the result of, quote, politicized approval process and, quote, illegal from the start. More than 100 studies conducted over a 30-year span have found that in 99% of instances, Mifeprestone works with no complications at all, making it safer than many common drugs, including Tylenol and Viagra. Elsewhere, Severino complains the CDC's abortion surveillance system is woefully inadequate, inadequate, and proposes turning the agency into a kind of snitch network that would collect data about who had abortions and where, and punish any states that refused to share that information. Quote, because liberal states have now become sanctuaries for abortion tourism, HHS should use every available tool, including the cutting of funds, to ensure that every state reports exactly how many abortions take place within its borders, at what gestational age, for what reason, the mother's state of residence, and by what method. Yeah, it's somebody saying this party of small government, it, like... Everybody knows it's not. Like, they, they are for things like small government when it comes to, if I can say, slurs. Like, that's that's something they want to let people be able to say more. Um, but actual, like, personal liberty. And somebody was asking earlier, how do states' rights factor into this? Like, they, they don't. They want to make these things illegal at a federal level. And then any states that go against it they want to punish like state that's 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 not a state like a state right should be able to to do that you know it's uh like every time i and i i would recommend going and reading this whole article but every time i read it it like that is one of the most chilling things is just somebody coming out and saying just coming out and saying how they want to like surveil and follow and essentially use government resources to stalk women so they can charge them with crimes for seeking an abortion. Like for, for seeking and utilizing their independent liberty over their own bodies. Uh, and now I want to talk a little bit about immigration because naturally that would be a huge part of Mr. Build the Wall's next government. From the Niskanen Center, Project 2025 unveiling the far right's plan to demolish immigration in Trump's second term. The most troubling proposals include plans to block federal financial aid for up to two-thirds of all American college students if their state permits certain immigrant groups, including dreamers with legal status, to access in-state tuition. Terminate the legal status of 500,000 dreamers by eliminating staff time for reviewing and processing renewal applications. Which, by the way, would mean half a million people who have legal status would be deported. Use backlog numbers to trigger the automatic suspension of application intake for larger categories of legal immigrants. 
Suspend updates to annual eligible country lists for H2A and H2B, temporary worker visas, thereby excluding most populations from filling critical gaps in the agricultural, construction, hospitality, and forestry sectors. Bar U.S. citizens from qualifying for federal housing subsidies if they live with anyone who is not a U.S. citizen. Force states to share driver's licenses and taxpayer identification information with federal authorities or risk critical funding. Uh, undermining humanitarian relief. The next Republican administration aligning with the mandate would also strip hundreds of thousands of individuals of their legal protections by repealing all temporary protected status designations. Nearly 700,000 individuals would lose legal protections and work authorization by repealing all active TPS designations. Not only would it create an enormous burden for immigrants, custom, and enforcement to attempt to remove these individuals, but it would also have devastating consequences for our labor market, families who have resided in the U.S. for decades, and our economy as home business owners are forced to leave the country. Yeah, so already you're talking about between dreamers and those folks, 700,000, 12, 1.2 million people. 1.2 million people. And those are just two two of the groups that they want to completely expel from the country. Now, of, of all of the things that I think they're actually capable of doing, the, the measures in, when it comes to this stuff, I think these are the least likely to take place because the work that it takes, like, they pay millions and millions to ICE, as it is, billions a year, to ICE, to Border Patrol, to National Guard, to all that shit, and it's still not enough. The idea that they're going to fire a shit ton of federal workers and then have them do all of this stuff, like, of, of everything else I can see pretty much happening the way they want it if they were to get Project 2025 in order, this there, there's no way this is happening in 180 days there, there's just not it's just not going to happen like that um but the fact that they have a relatively concrete plan to do it is still scary as shit and it still shows how ethno-nationalist they want to make this country which again if you haven't watched my cpac video the people in charge of the, the policy here are psychopaths like steve miller if, which, go go watch my footage of him to see what just a slimy human cockroach he is. Immediate removals of rejected visa applicants and beneficiaries. The mandate also states that any applicant rejected for an immigration benefit or status should be required to leave the U.S. immediately, at least until USCIS has cleared all case backlogs. The other, the other half of this is that they literally want to just drop them in Mexico. Just give them to Mexico regardless of what Mexico says, which... It's not going to work out. They're they're not just going to be able to hop the border and drop off over a million people. That's just not that's just not how it's going to happen. Ah, here's another fun one: limiting Americans' access to student aid. Twenty-three states and the District of Columbia permit undocumented immigrants to access in-state tuition. In total, there are nearly 10.7 million American students enrolled in higher education in states allowing illegal aliens to access in-state tuition. Under the proposed policy, up to 67% of all Americans enrolled in U.S. higher education could lose access to federal student aid because their state or university offers in-state tuition to undocumented or DACA students. Let's talk about, while we're on the subject of federal education, let's talk about public schooling. From the Bucks County Beacon, Project 2025 wants to end public education as we know it. Public education is a pillar of democracy that the right has long had in its crosshairs, which is true. Uh, the 2024 election may just determine whether this next domino falls. With the Trump campaign unaccountably staying afloat and strong, plenty of folks are worrying about what a second Trump term would mean. But while analysts have to search through various supporters in Trump's own word salad, a document from the Far Right Heritage Foundation lays out in considerable detail a plan. Heritage Foundation, blah, blah, blah. They have, this is talking about the Heritage Foundation, who in the past have worked to push critical race theory bans, praised Florida's dismantling of public education, and repeatedly argued for education funding to be voucherized. They even once tried to argue that school vouchers would increase the birth rate. The education chapter was written by Lindsay Burke, chief of the Heritage Center's Center for Education Policy. She also works at EdChoice, a school choice advocacy group formerly named after Milton Friedman. And was named, and she was part of Governor Glenn Youngkin's transition team in 2021. Here's the thing: school voucher programs is a rich person thing. 
Like whenever people start talking about school vouchers and you should be able to choose what school, it's a rich person thing. They want their kids to not have to go to school with the blacks or the browns or whoever they think isn't good enough. That is, that's the, the long and short of it. They want there to be rich kid schools and poor kid schools. In broad introductory terms, Burke calls for federal spending on education to be turned to block grants given to states without strings, aka regulations. Meanwhile, she calls for a big crackdown on the higher ed establishments captured by woke diversocrats and a de facto monopoly enforced by federal accreditation cartel. More education freedom, aka vouchers in a privatized system, including tax credit scholarships, which are a type of voucher that allows the wealthy to find private schools in lieu of paying taxes. State and local control facilitated by turning all federal funds into unregulated block grants. Treating taxpayers like investors in federal college student aid, they should get ROI on those loans and the loans should be repaid. Protect the loan portfolio from predatory politicians, which means I think Democrats made us look bad on the whole loan repayment thing, so make sure that doesn't happen again. Safeguard civil rights. Don't get excited. The rest of the explanation says, based on a proper understanding of those laws, rejecting gender ideology and critical race theory, which, you, like... Critical race theory and gender ideology are buzzwords, as we all know, but the ideas behind them are inextricably linked in America to civil rights movements, so it's fucking bonkers to say that. Burke argues that bureaucratic bloat has metastasized down into state and local systems with convoluted funding formulas, competitive grant applications, suffocating red tape, blah, blah, blah. Do, do, do. Title I funding, which provides support for low-income districts, should just be handed over as state grants that are no strings attached, i.e. taxpayer-funded grants with no regulation or oversight. Idea funding, created to help support students with special needs, should also be converted to unregulated block grants. So essentially, instead of specifically stipulating that money would go to, okay, you know what, this low-income community, their school needs computers. Their kids are falling behind, so we're putting aside a grant. Here's 10, 10 grand or you know, like 100 grand or whatever that goes to that. Instead... They'll say, okay, here's 100000 Instead of specifically for this, we're just giving 100000 to this education board to do whatever with. So do you think it's going to... Who, who do you think it's going to go to if it doesn't have earmarks saying where it's supposed to go? Concern that all this unregulated spending might result in discriminatory use of taxpayer resources? Heritage would axe the Department of Education Office of Civil Rights and let the Department of Justice, with no particular expertise in education and schools, handle issues. Handling of student loans should be privatized and treated like any other investment proposition. Heritage helpfully included a list of laws and regulations that must either be eliminated under a new Department of Education with all the details on how to devolve the agency, eliminating it as a standalone cabinet-level department. Tops on the list of rules to eliminate are Biden administration rules for the federal charter program, uh, charter school program. The program has been plagued with fraud and waste. And last year, the administration added some rules to help reduce the amount of taxpayer money being tossed away. Heritage would like to see all of those rules eliminated. They also want to eliminate all rules, regulations, and record keeping that in any way recognizes trans students so that the federal government will only recognize the gender a child was assigned at birth. Burke also argues at one point that amending Title IX to include anything other than, quote, biological sex recognized at birth actually, quote, puts girls and women in danger of physical harm. They want to see the new administration declare on its first day in office that sex is a fixed biological fact, which is something we'll, we're going to talk about in just a second. Uh, past national versions of the source of anti-critical race theory and don't say gay laws that have cropped up in red states. Under the umbrella of the Parents' Bill of Rights, Heritage suggests Congress consider those passed in Georgia, Florida, Montana, Wyoming, Idaho, Oklahoma, Virginia, and Arizona for a national model. Clamp down on, quote, racial gender ideology. Sorry. Clamp down on, quote, radical gender ideology with laws that forbid school employees using a name or pronoun for a student unless approved by parents, and even then, not if such a use would be contrary to the employee's religious or moral convictions. Heritage also favors the Education Choice for Children Act, a version of a tax credit scholarship voucher model, the same sort of thing provoked by known idiot Betsy DeVos, which allows donors to fund vouchers instead of paying taxes, thereby adding to the federal deficit. Throughout the proposal, Burke rattles the same alarms. Critical race theory and radical gender ideology are everywhere. Department of Defense schools are teaching this stuff. It's everywhere. Burke also plays the old standard, we've spent all this money and test scores are still terrible, so we must have school choice. The report includes panic talk about NAEP results. Only around one-third of eighth graders were proficient, she says, failing to mention that NAEP proficiency is equivalent to being an A student. And she offers plenty of scary graphs. It's a lesson in how to use the Y-axis. Here's the heritage graph. 
and you'll see here, versus the same data in a somewhat more realistic graph, which you can see Heritage, like quite literally, is using between 255 and 270. But when you adjust it and it goes down to zero, oh, look at that. It's actually not that bad. The Heritage Future. In Project 2025, Heritage argues for a future in which teachers are gagged, the federal government provides no oversight or accountability for taxpayer dollars spent on education, and parents are handed a voucher and told to fend for themselves in an unregulated marketplace. That's the plan they'll push on a conservative president should we elect one the next time around, which means that those who believe in equality, public education as a shared responsibility and promise to every American student should start working on election Project 2024 to ensure that Project 2025 never gathers anything but dust. Hell yeah. Uh, from Bucks County Beacon, this is a phenomenal uh, article that you should check out. Let's talk about what would happen to LGBTQ rights. Trans people, queer people, gay marriage, all that stuff. The New Republic. Conservatives plan to ban abortion and cut LGBT rights starting next January. And as we talked about at the beginning, we were talking about this same quote from Kevin Roberts. Look at America under the ruling and cultural elite today. Children suffer the toxic normalization of trans... Just... God, this is just word salad. Children suffer the toxic normalization of transgenderism with drag queens and pornography invading their school libraries. Project 2025 claims to represent the consensus recommendations of the entire conservative movement for addressing purported crises like these. Crises like these. Make no mistake, as steeped as Project 2025 is in conspiracy... Uh, in the conspiratorial imagination of the right, its plan is comprehensive and dangerous. Healthcare providers, educators, employers, and the government's own civil rights enforcement apparatus, among many others, would all be marshaled to ensure our acquiescence in this dictatorial male supremacist society. And as part of Project 2025, they would equate legal personhood with heterosexuality, gender conformity, and compulsory motherhood by removing mention of any alternative from all laws, all government agencies, all grants and contracts, and any other official regulations. I talk about this in the CPAC video, but they would quite literally remove definitions from scientific studies, texts, manuscripts, institutions, to better fit the definitions they want. The definitions, as we saw at the beginning, are driven by Christo-fascism and Christian nationalism. The next conservative president must make the institutions of American civil society hard targets for woke culture warriors. Project 2025's playbook states in his foreword, a hard target is a term of art in the military, security, and surveillance referring to a secured location meant to withstand an outside attack. Uh, hardening the target in this case, the playbook continues, starts with deleting the terms sexual orientation and gender ideology, diversity, equity, and inclusion, gender, gender equality, gender equity, gender awareness, gender sensitive abortion, reproductive health, reproductive rights, and any other term used to deprive Americans of their First Amendment rights. Parenthetical note, the reference to First Amendment rights here is typically code for a religiously or otherwise motivated choice to discriminate. End quote. Uh, or, and parenthetical, out of every federal rule, agency regulation, contract, grant regulation, and piece of legislation that exists. So, as we were talking about at the beginning, this is, of course, they want to d d defend free speech by basically removing any, like, protected speech. Like, basically removing any classes, like, any, removing the idea of hate speech entirely so that you can't really if, if, they, if we don't define anything as hate speech well then nothing can be hate speech this deletion of terms is a global recommendation in the playbook everything else is premised on this it is not new the trump administration proposed redefining sex across all federal agencies in 2018 in such a way as to exclude trans people which could in turn result in denying trans people protections under anti-discrimination laws so, see this is this is exactly what i was talking about in the cpac video it's not that they will just discriminate against trans people. They will say that transgender people do not exist. They will redefine, legally redefine agencies like the EPA, the CDC, medical associations to use their terminology so that they can say nobody is trans. Transgender people do not exist. 
a policy that allows for increased job and housing discrimination, among other forms of discrimination, allows for government enforced poverty and homelessness for an entire generation of people who simply want to live their lives as their authentic selves, noted activist Evan Greer at the time. Quote, the end goal here is no less than the complete ostracization of trans people from public life. This is an attempt to disappear us, end quote. When asked whether they saw those efforts as an attempt at erasing types of people, neither Project 2025 nor the Heritage Foundation responded to our emails before publication. Noted, if you've read through these other articles, they have a habit of not doing that. Erasure from official public records and policy often accompanies exclusion in other concrete ways, which Project 2025 also suggests. Throughout the report, and in the Health and Human Services chapter, especially the family, adhering to this rigid definition is privileged as the basis for policy. <coughs> Excuse me. The roadmap says the next HHS secretary should, quote, proudly state that men and women are biological realities that are crucial to the advancement of life sciences and medical care, and that married men and women are the ideal natural family structure. Again, there's no, like, actual tangible proof for this. This is where that Christian ideology comes in, where they can say, okay, well, this is, it, you know, it was meant to be one man and one woman. It claims that under Biden, HHS is fraught with agenda items focused on LGBTQ plus equity, subsidizing single motherhood, disincentivizing work, and penalizing marriage. These policies should be repealed and replaced by policies that support the formation of stable married nuclear families. In addition to gutting any policy related to LGBTQ families or single mother-led families, some of these replacement proposals include, quote, prioritizing married father engagement in health and welfare policies, emphasizing marriage pro and health and education programs, ending the Head Start preschool program for low-income families. There we go again. You notice how low-income people usually get shafted here. And allowing child abuse prevention funds to go to marriage promotion programming. Really, really read that. Allowing child prevention, allowing child abuse prevention funds to go to marriage promotion program. They want to make sure more people are having babies but again don't really want to don't really want to make sure those babies are protected or safe shucker centers for disease control and prevention should be directly <clears throat> the centers for disease control and prevention should be directed to quote eliminate programs and projects that do not respect human life and conscience rights and that undermine family formation and what they mean by that is abortion adopt the position that abortion is murder and harms women strike the word abortion from all laws policies and regulations the playbook says that government should pursue research, quote, on the comparative health and psychological benefits of childbirth versus the health and psychological risk of intentionally taking a human life through abortion. This research question preemptively takes the stance that the government could consider should consider abortion to be murder. It also specifies that the CDC, quote, should ensure that it is not promoting abortion as health care. Instead, the government should, quote, create and promote a research agenda that supports pro-life policies and explores the harms, both mental and physicals, that abortion has wrought on women and girls. How it will do all this without using the now-banned word abortion is unclear. Which is is another good thing is that, or another good thing to, to lay out and show is that they want to ban these things. They want to replace them with their ideas. But in terms here, they are literally begging the question. Like they, they want to take up new research that they will set out with, and this is this is not the goal of research, by the way. The goal of research in science is to earnestly, you, like you might have a hypothesis, but you do not lead with the hypothesis. You ask the question, and then you see if the data backs that up. You do not go searching for data to back it up, because guess what? What you're going to do, and I, I talked about this in the anti-Semitism essay, what you're going to do is you're going to find stuff that proves you right. If you go looking for things that will prove you right, you're going to find it. And in the process, you're going to ignore the massive amounts of data that will prove you wrong. And that is exactly what they want to do here. Speaking of which, overhaul policy and research to deny the existence of transgender and non-binary people and instead pursue methods of ensuring children remain the sex they were assigned at birth. The playbook states that the president should declare to education agencies and officials that, quote, sex is properly understood as a fixed biological fact. The CDC should be ordered to stop collecting data on gender identity, which legitimizes the unscientific notion that men can become women and encourages the phenomena of ever multiplying subjective identities. The playbook suggests the president eliminate all government research involving trans people, claiming that the National Institute for Health is, quote, at the forefront in pushing junk gender science and recommending that the next HHS secretary should 
immediately put an end to the department's foray into woke transgender activism. So again, it doesn't matter that these things are settled science, that there are reams upon reams of pieces of research, ongoing studies right now, scientists, psychologists, psychiatrists, so many people working to uncover these mysteries of the human mind. They would simply say, they would come into office and say, no, that doesn't exist because we say it doesn't. There are no trans people. And people will say, yes, but look at all the research. And they'll say, what research? We deleted it all. They'll say, yes, but look at all this data. What data? We made our own studies to specifically disprove that data. And guess what? We found what we were looking for. This, there is an exception. Quote, and here we go. Fund studies into the short-term and long-term negative effects of cross-sex interventions, including affirmation, puberty blockers, cross-sex hormones and surgeries, and the likelihood of desistance if young people are given counseling that does not include medical or social interventions. That is, and here's a great summation. This is why I've read this almost this entire article. That is, research on gender non-conforming children and teenagers should be funded by the government, but only for the purpose of studying what will make them conform such as denying them gender-affirming care and instead trying to change their identities through counseling, which is a form of conversion therapy. Related to this, the playbook says all school staff should be prohibited from referring to any student by a gender or name different from the one on their birth certificate without the written permission of the student's parents or guardians. Outlaw anything conservatives deem pornographic, treating the public presence and depictions of queer and trans people as a threat to children and families. Shut down or imprison any individual or company that discusses or shares such depictions. And here's the interesting thing. They say pornography, but in this, they are already bending the definition of what pornography is to just include, seemingly, depictions of transgender people. Quote, pornography should be outlawed, the Roadmap decrees. The people who produce and distribute it should be imprisoned. Educators and public librarians who purvey it should be classed as registered sex offenders, and telecommunications and technology firms that facilitate its spread should be shuttered. Now, you might question, who, what? Public librarians or educators are spreading pornography. And then I want you to think back to the CPAC video and think back to uh, the woman I interviewed who was on the Hands Off Our Kids campaign and how she seemed to define literally anything, any part of sex education, anything that literally showed nudity or sexuality in any light as pornography, which is not the case. Um, sometimes it's literally just like sex education, and biology textbooks. But what they are meaning here, and they explain it right here, <coughs> it's important to understand what conservatives mean by pornography here. The roadmap refers to, quote, pornography manifested today in the omnipresent propagation of transgender ideology and sexualization of children. End quote. This language suggests that the document is adopting the thesis animating right-wing threats and attacks targeting LGBTQ spaces, books, and people. The old trope that lesbian, gay, and bisexual people are out to recruit children and that depictions of their lives are meant to seduce children away from heterosexuality. This thinking holds that transgender people are evidence of a contagious ideology at risk of infecting children. Requests to define what was meant here by pornography sent to both Project 2025 and Kevin uh, did not get a response. So what the playbook seems to be proposing here is that public institutions such as schools and libraries regard any presence or depiction of queer and trans life as a potential sex offense to be reported. Similarly, school media platforms would risk government seizure if they served as a platform for any presence or depiction of queer and trans life. And here is also where we get into why what libs of TikTok does, what Matt Walsh does when they spread around these lies about trans people and gender nonconforming people why it's so dangerous. Because if you go and call out Haya Raichik or anybody on their shit, almost without fail, you'll get somebody in the comments saying, well, why are you so mad? Haya is just showing what these liberals are doing. They're just showing what the gender critic, their gender criticals, what the gender ideology believes. Except she's not really. She is providing, she's removing the original framing and context of people's posts and substituting her own. She is putting people who might just be trans or queer, might just be a little bit weird sometimes, alongside stories of actual pedophiles, actual sexual assaulters, 
while completely ignoring all of the other normal trans people, all the people just trying to live their lives, or even worse, the people who are constantly being assaulted and murdered. And what that creates for her viewers, for people who follow Libs of TikTok, Matt Walsh, people like them, is a ingrained understanding when you see these stories alongside one another that trans people as a whole are dangerous. Trans people as a whole are deviant and pornographic. Despite that very obviously not being the case, research still shows that child abuse is more likely, more likely than not, to come from church members, and even before that, family members, than it is trans people. Again, if these people actually cared about kids, they'd be sharing real statistics like that. They don't. They want to spread hate. And the worrying part about this legislation and what's proposed in Project 2025 is how it correlates with that. Because at what point, if you are out walking, as a, and I, I say this as somebody who dresses up femininely and I walk around town all the time. Like I will wear cute outfits to go out dancing or go out to a restaurant or go just do something all the time. Now, say this legislation gets passed and these depictions of trans people in public life are deemed as pornography. They are deemed to be harming children. This is just this is just talking about me, not talking about any other trans people. What is to stop somebody from seeing me walking down the street? Seeing me if there's a, a kid with his mom and a dog is walking by with them, or or my dog stops and the kid wants to pet it. What's to stop somebody from seeing me say hi to the kid as he wants to pet my dog, saying, oh, you know, okay, just hold out your hand, be very careful, and going about my way. But because I even had a momentary interaction with the child as a trans person, they could call the police on me, have me arrested, charged with a sex crime. And people will say, well, that's a little extreme. Yeah, it is. But again, under the new rules, what, who, who is going to stop that from happening? What, what government advocacy groups are going to stop that from happening? The ones that are stripped? Or the ones that are stuffed with Trump sycophants? MAGA loyalists? The same people who believe shit that Libs of TikTok keeps putting out? So what Project 2025 Playbook seems to be proposing here is that public institutions regard any presence or depiction of queer and trans life as a potential sex offense to be reported. And again, remember, remember what we were talking about? The people who produce and distribute it, mind you, that's what they define as pornography. And they think the people who produce that should be imprisoned, classed as registered sex offenders. And where does that end? This is the America envisioned by Project 2025, one in which gender and sexuality are not acknowledged as actually existing outside patriarchal and nuclear families. All that exists here is mothers and babies, children and families. Each family is meant to function as an extension of the state, dedicated to controlling and confining sex, gender, and sexuality with all the coercive power and violence that would require. Full compliance could only be accomplished through self-policing under intimidation. These groups know they cannot expect people to do that completely. They know they cannot force everyone to be straight, to marry, to deny their gender, to birth a child. They know people will refuse. What they want is to use that inevitable non-compliance as a threat and a tool. This playbook, the groups and donors behind it, the installation of ideologically motivated staff across government agencies, and the theory that the Constitution permits the executive to rule absolutely is more than guidance for a new conservative presidential administration. It is also one of the right's most open admissions that they aim to install an authoritarian ruler and roll out a 21st century American fascism. At its heart is a plan of mass reproductive and sexual coercion, casting whole populations as deviants who threaten the nation, denying them legal personhood. Historically, it has been a short step from there to plans to eliminate whole classes of people altogether. And mind you, there's, there's more stuff than that. But to me, between immigration, between deregulation, climate crisis, of course, trans rights, Christian nationalism, abortion rights, those are the broad points of what Project 2025 is and what it really aims to accomplish in America, which is the total overhaul of America to fall in line with 
the principle is that otherwise here here's really why you're getting so many uh so much money behind this is that otherwise conservatives know they could never pass this shit they can never make it happen anti-trans measures are broadly unpopular in elections they have repeatedly lost people elections because they focus only on that abortion is broadly popular but the fascists, the people who are really running the conservative movement right now, and the business cult they serve, the billionaires, people like the Koch brothers, people like those who run the Heritage Foundation, want to turn America into a place where they can profit the most. And they do not give a damn who suffers because of it. Project 2025 shows that it's not just Trump we have to worry about. It's not just him who's enacting these plans. There is an entire cadre working behind him who are trying to use Trump to enact the policies they want to see enacted. That without him, they would never see actually come to fruition. And Project 2025 is their chance. It is their last ditch effort to get all of this shit done. In, in clear terms. And I've, I've seen people asking in the comments, how, what are the odds this happens? I mean, I would like to say zero. I would like to say in, in a logical real world, if, <laughs> if the Democrats actually did their fucking jobs, somebody at some point would have been like, yeah, Trump can't run for office again. Like that's not happening. Like, sorry, you can't, be coming up on federal charges and also run for president like that's like new rule we just made sorry like i don't care how how you do it i don't think you should be investigated for provable crimes but that's the world we live in where he is he is currently coming up on federal charges and is able to run and Against Biden, who has been largely ineffective, who has done fuck all to tangibly help trans people, despite trans people and LGBTQ minorities, despite constantly giving lip service to it, who has done next to nothing to stop the ongoing genocide in Palestine, the comfortable Democratic Party, which is a geritocracy, run by people like Pelosi, run by people like Schumer, and of course Biden, is out of touch with mainstream America. Holy. They don't fight for the right issues. They don't fight for the things that actually matter. And they constantly let Republicans get away with taking cheap shots and don't stand up to them. So we already have an ineffective leader who is doing more harm than good, like most presidents. But this plan is so dystopian, so overreaching. I don't think people understand when people are like, okay, well, what are the odds of this actually happening? That's the entire point of them doing this. That's the entire point of them making a 900 page document is they want to roll it out day one they want to hit the ground running on the first day and start rolling it out over the next 180. And that doesn't mean that every illegal immigrant or every, like, every last state will ban abortion. But they have a concrete plan to start the reorganizing, to start everything, so that all of these policies will take place over the ensuing four years. And what's worse, they have policies in place to make sure that even if Trump goes... The people loyal to him will be so deeply ingrained in the country that the style of governance will have to remain at some level. Yeah, and so Fire Corgi is saying current polls say it's a 50-50 that Trump wins. When people say, like, what are the odds of this actually, of Project 2025 happening? 50%. It's half and half. And the half is if Trump wins. Like, it really is a case of the, not even the devil, you know, because we know, like... Like, that's the real pain in the ass here, is it's between two presidents we've already had. You know, it's not like between, oh, Trump and then the other guy we haven't tried before, or Biden, and uh, maybe this guy has new ideas. It's like, 
no, th this all happened recently. Like, we were, we were all here for all of this. And it, it feels like we're just going in fucking circles. And maybe this is just circling the drain as a, as a, a state. But, um, yeah, an angry goose. Trump is even more fervently pro-Israel. Absolutely. Yeah, go go and watch my um, my CPAC video where I showed the commercials they were playing and the, pe the people they brought on to talk about Israel-Palestine where they do nothing but portray Israel as these just brave heroic soldiers and Palestine and anybody who, not, not just Palestinians, not just Hamas, but literally anybody who's like, hey, maybe Israel shouldn't be massacring civilians. They try and the, the Trump brand of conservatism right now paints those people as radical terrorists for, for advocating for maybe not firebombing just large populations of civilians willy-nilly. So, like, yes, under Trump, again, this shit would get so much worse. So much worse. Much like with trans stuff. And, and it's hard to imagine how that could even happen with the, the case of everything happening in Palestine. But, like, I mean, if, if Trump were there, I don't think... Palestine would be there anymore. If Trump were in office right now, as as much as Joe Biden has done fuck all to stop it and has been supporting Israel and we we just passed another fucking spending bill giving billions of dollars to Israel, I know if Trump were there, he would be like right next to Netanyahu saying, "Oh yeah, pave over the thing, turn it into a parking lot." And yeah, and Jen Scarl, I think anybody who sits out election day like you, they just they do not care. They do not care about what happens. Like, I think being able to sit out is a a form of comfort, honestly. Um, I I I seriously like. I doubt the investment of anybody who's like, yeah, I'm just not voting. Like, I'm like, okay, are you are you just like seriously unaffected? Are you insulated from every possible outcome? Because what the fuck, man?